Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. I realize this is uh, probably one of the last sessions or the last session most of you guys will attend today, so I appreciate you hanging out until we uh, got to kick this one off. Uh, my name is Paul Bockelman. I'm a solutions architect with our worldwide public sector at Amazon Web Services. Um, I've been a member of the team that is launching the VMware Cloud on AWS solution since predating the October 2016 announcement. And it's been quite a journey. Um, you know, getting to see how two, uh, two companies like VMware and AWS come together and bring their engineering teams together to bring something like this to market as quickly um, as it's being done today has been something definitely to, be, to watch. And I've been uh, really excited to be a part of it. <clears throat> So what am I going to talk about today? Um, well, we're here to talk about VMware Cloud on AWS, obviously, but I want to take you through a couple different things. First off, we're going to revisit hybrid, right? Big industry term, everybody talks about it. All the consultants talk about it. I used to be one of those consultants always talking about it, but what are we really talking about? So I want to baseline everything there. And then we'll get into the product overview. Then I'll drill down into kind of what are the components, and then uh, we'll cover some use cases, like how does all of this come together to actually be usable. And so if we revisit the NIST definition for cloud, um, this is something I always hated doing, but because I always said I'd never be that guy that would throw a NIST slide up in a cloud presentation, but I have a good reason for it here. Uh, so when we look at the first uh, definition, we look at private cloud, clearly we're talking about VMware uh, in this space. I mean, it's solely for an organization that exists on-prem, maybe off-prem, but it's, it's for that single organization. And then you get into public cloud. You're talking about AWS here. So this is something that's publicly available. Anybody can consume it. You don't be, need to be a member of any affinity group or anything like that to get into it. You just swipe and go from any organizations. So when we talk about a community cloud, in many cases, um, both VMware and AWS actually have community clouds or what those folks out in the industry will, will argue that are community clouds. Um, from an AWS perspective, if you look at what we've done with the U.S. federal government, um, that, uh, that, that piece speaks a lot to where we're going. Uh, on the VMware side, VMware is very well established in the, in the federal civilian governments and in national governments around the world. And so, you know, the mix between the two, um, you know, the affinity groups that may be uh, members of those, those clouds, um, it definitely is not shrinking. It's only growing. And so when we look at hybrid, what we're talking about is really a composition of two or more of these definitions of types of clouds. So we have our private cloud, we have our public cloud, mix the two together, and we have hybrid. But it's more than just that, right? I mean, the definition is super simple. So you know, what do customers really want out of hybrid when we're talking about this? You know, first off, they still want to run workloads on-prem. I mean, you're never really going to ever get rid of all the data centers in all of the companies around the world. There are workloads that make sense to keep on-prem. There are workloads, perhaps data uh, requirements, security requirements where a customer may feel better uh, or safer having that asset living outside of their infrastructure. It's not a problem. But they are also facing ever-increasing mandates for cloud, cloud first, um, you know, the US federal government that's something I, uh, an entity I work a lot with. They have a cloud-first policies in many of the departments. But what does that really mean, right? You just pick everything up, vacate a server on-prem, stick it in the cloud, check the box, you're done. Well, maybe it's not that easy. So when you have both the on-prem and the cloud-based, customers want to be able to, if they're going to coexist in both environments, they want them to be tightly integrated. Tight integration can mean a couple different things. It could be tightly integrating the networks. It could be integrating um, the management overlay, the stack, how you're going to operate the environment. A couple different things it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And then, oh, by the way, they don't want to have to buy new hardware. So I think we're pretty well positioned uh, in this partnership to be able to attend to all of these different customer um, desires when it comes to cloud or hybrid cloud, rather. And, but why is it not as widespread as one would like to think? I mean, the technologies have existed for a while. VMware has been around for decades. AWS is 10 years old. So why is it not just magically, auto-magically happening that they're coexisting and working together? 
there's a couple different factors. One is you're dealing with multiple machine formats. So AWS, you're dealing with AMIs. You're living with AMIs on a hypervisor that is not ESX. And so if you're going to move a workload either from a VMware environment to AWS or vice versa, it's likely that if you're not using some type of um, uh, partner solution, you're likely going to take an outage at some point, potentially. I mean, there are um, some pretty hefty partner solutions in our ecosystem that allow you to actually clone these systems and do block-for-block -block replications and things like that. But that doesn't appeal to everybody. A lot of people don't want to bring a new tool like that into the environment. So when you look at the multiple machine formats, that tends to be a little bit of a blocker. It's not a stopper. It tends to be a blocker to progress. And then when you get into the networks, this one can be a little misleading for people. Um, the incongruence that I'm talking about here when it comes to the networks is more along the lines of, I mean, it's IP routing, right? IP is IP. However, when you're managing a network in VMware, the way that you manage that network is a lot different than the way you manage a network in AWS. And so even though you can ultimately get them connected and have them communicate with one another and do a very good job at that and have it work really well, they just feel like they're different networks, even though you're still trying to mesh them and make them into one. Operational inconsistencies. So when you think about that, just touched on it, the way you operate a VMware network, the tools that you're going to use, the components that you're going to touch, the APIs that you're going to use are different than on the AWS side. So you have that, that inconsistency. For, you know, if you're a very agile organization and have a team of developers or a, a, a relatively um, developed and robust DevOps organization, that may not be an issue. You could probably adapt to it without any problems. But if you're a traditional organization where you've actually have silos of operations folks that are really deep in certain technologies, this starts to become a little bit of a problem and creates itself as a blocker. Again, it creates friction for doing the hybrid story. And so that leads to the next conclusion here is, is like, well, if you're pretty deep in certain areas, then you're probably going to have to learn some new tools, some new skills, one way or the other. And then you get into different control mechanisms. And so for commercial customers, this isn't always a big issue. But when you get into workloads that are highly compliant or they have compliance requirements, you're trying to meet compliance regimes. Perhaps you have unique security requirements, certain routing um, uh, proto you know, uh, methods of which you can be able to get to and from that network. It's just really complex customers. When you start getting into the monitoring and controls around there, there's usually a whole bunch of controls that come with that unique situation. And so when you're looking at things from a VMware perspective, you typically control the whole stack. You have the hardware, you have the hypervisor, you have everything in between. And so if you're going to go for uh, certification of this platform, it's the whole stack. Now, if you look at it on AWS, we have a whole host of compliance um, certifications that we've achieved, and we continue to add to that. You know, we, I think we adhere to over 3,000 controls. And so that platform is highly, you know, pretty much been through the gambit when it comes to looking at it from a secure, uh, certification and controls perspective. Uh, but that, you know, that doesn't necessarily help the VMware customers, not unless you put the two together. And so when you put the two together, you have the opportunity to do things like inherit a lot of the certifications and controls that AWS has in place. And now you have VMware certifications that can occur where you're certifying the software stack. And then you inherit the infrastructure stack. That's just one of the many scenarios. And so if we get into a product overview, what are we talking about here? <clears throat> the three key pillars of this product is ESX, it's NSX and it's vSAN. So we've got the vSphere product family, vSAN, and NSX. Let's talk about the hypervisor for a minute. What we have going on with the hypervisor is ESX running on bare metal. This is not nested virtualization. A lot of folks jump to the conclusion, oh, you, you guys figure out a way to get super creative and optimize ESX running inside of AWS's hypervisor. No. We've removed our hypervisor, and ESX is running on bare metal. I'll get into a little bit more on the specifics with that. When it comes to NSX, we have the NSX overlay network 
that technology will be in place and operating fully um, as a VMware environment. Even though it sits inside of AWS, it's a VMware environment. And so that lives inside of our VPC. Again, I'll expand on that. And then when we get into vSAN, the storage component here is all integrated into the stack. The storage will be pre-provisioned and the data stores made available to the customers that, that provision the stack. Uh, ultimately, it's, if you're looking at this through the, um, the lens of, of vSphere or a vCenter, it looks like you're just running on v, uh, VMware. You're running in a data center that's running VMware. The abstraction to things that are happening underneath, that's, been, that's all pulled away from you as a customer, and I'll expand on that. And so all of that's sitting on our global infrastructure, and if you connect up your, man, your customer site uh, through enhanced link mode for vCenter, you can now begin to have the environments that live on AWS co-operated. Uh, co, uh, well, co co I was going to say co-mingled, but that's not really the case. But you're operating them inside of the same domain. You're functioning, um, having these environments function very much like your on-prem environment. It's another site. It's another set of resources. It's another um, uh, cluster. And so things like vRealize, you know, for customers that have autom you know, uh, made a pretty substantial investment into autom automating their environment, uh, creating different workflows for managing the environment, it'll still work. It's another data center. It's another site inside of vCenter. And so there are a few edge cases uh, with vRealize as, as, as there would be with other um, tertiary tools on the edge here um, where things may not necessarily work as they would in an on-prem environment, and that's because some of the control of the environment's been abstracted away from you. It's a managed service. And so then when we look at it's running on AWS, now you have the opportunity to consume other native AWS services that live inside of the same region. And so in order to get this to happen, we've got the VPC in both, both places. We've got an encapsulated network with NSX running inside the VPC. How do you get the two to communicate? And that's what we've been working on a lot since before the announcement. Uh, it's been quite the endeavor. And so let's take a view of this from the AWS world. So when a customer goes in and requests this service, now one thing I didn't really talk about is this is a service that you buy from VMware. It's not going to show up as one of the icons in AWS console. This is a VMware service. It's sold by VMware. It's operated by VMware. It's supported by VMware. Um, so why is the AWS guy talking about it? That's the question I always get. Um, this is, a big, this is a big commitment from both companies. Uh, we're heavily integrated at all levels, you know, from the engineering, from, literally from the executive, the marketing, the engineering, and in the field enablement. Um, but when we look at this from the, v, uh, the AWS view, a customer will go into their VMware account console, and they'll request the provisioning of a cluster. And in that cluster, a number of components required to ex operate that stack will be created all provisioned automatically for the customer. So for, cust for folks out there who have actually gone out and built VMware environments from the ground up and have felt you know, some of the, uh, the bumps and bruises that go along with that, um, it's done for you. It's presented, this equipment is all provisioned on your behalf. The network, the, <clears throat> the hypervisors, all of the, uh, the control components, all deployed for you. It's all been, it, the provisioning process as part of this engineering, just joint ep, engineering effort has been to make this, this process as seamless and as frictionless as possible for the customers. And so what do you get? So when it stands up inside of a VPC, there's a number of instances, EC2 instances that will be running. Those will be bare metal running the ESX hypervisor. You have the different controllers, the NSX managers, vCenter, all of those things are stood up and operated in that environment and you're going to be getting the latest software. So the latest release of the VMware software is what will be deployed and what will actually be maintained inside of this environment on, be, on your behalf as a customer. So when you get into things like upgrading, patch management around the hypervisor, that's, that's taken care of for you. And I'll drill into that a bit. The next point here I think is pretty important. We talk about dynamic capacity. 
you know, dynamic capacity in an on-prem data center, it's a little tough to achieve. So it means the company's gonna have to go out and acquire a bunch of hardware. It's gonna sit in the racks, be powered on, and be sitting there waiting for something to happen. Um, I'm sure there are organizations out there somewhere in the world where that's pretty common practice. I haven't come across any. But what we have here is the ability to provision additional ESX nodes using the elasticity of AWS. So no longer is it a, a call to, well, first get all of the approvals to add an ESX um, node, and then calling for procurement and asking them to buy you some hardware, and then hardware gets sent to you weeks later, months later, however long it takes, gets installed in the rack, you have engineering, wire this thing up, plummet, ready to go. You know, you could be talking anywhere from, let's be super you know, um, aggressive here and say maybe it's a week, right? Maybe it's three months. Could be somewhere in between or maybe even farther out. I, I know some couple customers, probably six months. But we're talking about provisioning in 15 minutes or less, an additional node to add to your cluster. And that's pretty substantial, especially when you're talking about spiky workloads, perhaps seasonal demand, things like that. When you remove ESX nodes from this cluster, you're not paying for them anymore. It's still, you're running on AWS. And so the, the, the approach for licensing this environment uh, from VMware has been aligned very, very much to with the way the customers are used to being able to buy things at AWS. So there's a lot of synergy there. And so from the topology, um, it's a standalone cluster that will be operating in an account that is a dedicated account for the customer that has a provisioned. Key there, dedicated. We're not talking um, multiple tenancy. You know, this is a single tenant account. So there's an AWS account that is created for you when you uh, request to provision a service. That account is stood up. All of these components are created on your behalf. And that VPC inside of that account is dedicated to you um, to operate. You don't have to worry about any other users or any other organizations. And so if we look at the integration, so now we have the AWS global infrastructure, you have the VMware hypervisor sitting on top of it, now you have the ability to integrate to native AWS services. So any of the services that are running inside of the region that is chosen are services that you can consume. And you know, what's interesting is, is when, when the announcement first came out, the conversation that I was having with customers was, well, why would AWS do this? Or why would VMware do this? What's the, what's the compelling event for them to do this? And then as customers learned a little more and more about why this is happening, they started thinking, well, wait a minute. There are things that I'm running in my VMware environment that I wouldn't mind consuming AWS services natively. RDS is a great example of that. They want to get out of running databases. So they want to consume a managed service. And there are other examples like that. And so when we take a look at the operations and support, remember, this is a managed service. Eh, not a managed service. Let me erase that. This is a service that's being operated on your behalf. Managed service takes a different, a different um, meaning. Uh, it's different organizations. This service is stood up, and it operates for you, and it's operated on your behalf. And so the provisioning, the ongoing maintenance, um, the operations, all done by VMware on your behalf. When you get into the operations, if you have any technical support issues, you're making a phone call to VMware support. You're not having to make a phone call to AWS. And the reason for that is, is VMware is technically our customer. They're operating this environment on our infrastructure on your behalf as a customer. So if there are any technology issues related to the underlying AWS infrastructure, VMware's the customer that we're gonna deal with directly. In fact, we don't even know necessarily that you're the customer that's consuming the service. And so from a uh, support perspective, that should simplify things a lot for you, the customer. You have one person to call, one belly button to push. Use whatever phrase you wanna use, right? And so if there's any issues related to the underlying infrastructure, VMware will work that out with AWS directly. So the customer doesn't have to worry about, oh man, is this an ESX problem? Is this a VPC problem? Where, lies the pro you know, where is this issue? How do we fix it? Make a call to support, 
VMware support will diagnose any issues and they'll work with you to get it resolved directly. And they'll work with AWS where appropriate. And from a maintenance perspective, so ongoing maintenance of the environment is something that, a, that VMware will be providing as part of your subscription. This is delivered as a subscription model. And so things like upgrading the hypervisor, patching the hypervisor, these are things that VMware will do on your behalf as a customer. And so you don't have to worry about putting a machine into maintenance mode, taking it offline, up, updating the ESX uh, components, bringing, shifting capacity around necessarily. This is something that VMware largely is going to, and, and VMware will work with the customers. It's not like you're blindly gonna have an ESX node disappear because they decided they wanna do some maintenance. You know, there's, there's communication with the customer. But ultimately, I think one of the key factors here is, as a customer, when you decide how large of a cluster that you want to uh, subscribe to, initially we're talking a minimum of four nodes, up to 16 nodes. So if you subscribe to a four node cluster, and then there's maintenance that's required, as part of this maintenance, you're still gonna be able to get the same amount of resources that you subscribe to without having to, you know, if you're gonna have a node that goes into service, it's coming out of your cluster, there'll be another one inserted for you so that you can maintain your capacity. And that's part of the service that AWS working with VMware, actually VMware's doing it, VMware is going to make, make sure that you maintain your subscribe capacity. So what are some of the use cases and scenarios, right? So a couple of them are, you're going to maintain your current environment, but you want to expand out into the cloud. Perhaps you're looking to have a separate site. You want to have separation for um, disaster recovery, DR coop scenarios, um, or just expanding into new territories, new markets. You want to put the workloads closer to the end users. And then we get into the next one, which is really consolidation. Uh, a lot of the customers in the federal space, they're being given mandates. Consolidate, data center consolidation. Shut down your physical data center, move it to the cloud. So there's customers are facing that pressure. There's other customers that are willing, that are inviting that activity. They want to get out of the business of running data centers. And so they're looking for a place to move their VMware environment without having to re-engineer everything. And so when we talk about scenario two, it's pretty compelling. And then we get into scenario three where we're talking about flexibility, having both the environments coexist. And the users will decide where their workload want, needs to run. Perhaps you have cyclical demand, perhaps you have planned spikes, periods where you're gonna have heavy, heavy workloads and you wanna have additional capacity that you can um, consume that's an opportunity to use this environment. Uh, you can use it for production, dev, test, training, whatever it is you want to use it for. The thing about this is, is when you consume uh, the service and you subscribe to it, you don't have to pick which one of these scenarios you plan on using it for. You don't have to say, well, I'm going to get you know, two of the scenario one and one of scenario three. You don't have to do that. You stand the environment up. You connect it to your existing environment and you just start using it. Use it the way that your business requires you to use it. And so if we get into account structures, this is where things start to go a little sideways for people. <clears throat> Remember, this is a service that's being operated on your behalf as a customer. So the VMware infrastructure that I showed before is not being provisioned into an account that you, the customer, owns and controls. It's a service that's being managed and operated for you. And so as part of your subscription, when you um, subscribe to this service and you press the button to launch the environment, VMware will create a new AWS account that is just for you, for you, for your company, for your organization, whatever it may be. That's dedicated to you. And inside of that account, is where the, uh, all of the infrastructure is stood up. Now that infrastructure that's up and running will be operated and paid by VMware. So you're not gonna get a, a bill that says, well, here's this account that you don't have control of, and here's a whole bunch of servers in it, and then here's the bill every month. You're not gonna get that. You pay your subscription to VMware. VMware's subscription costs will be inclusive of things like 
the infrastructure that you're consuming, the underlying AWS resources. It'll be licensing. It'll be the operations, the cost to actually manage this environment and run it for you. That's all bundled up into the monthly fees. Again, a single tenant. Very important, particularly for customers that have pretty sensitive workloads that may be looking to move in here. Um, they don't have to worry about, eh, well, who's, are there other ESX nodes that are running inside of that VPC that I don't see, but I need to worry about? Or does VMware have just one account with 1,000 v, uh, VPCs in it? You don't have to worry about that. It's one-to-one, one-to-one -one, one -one mapping. In fact, if you were to stand up a second VMC account, you would get a new AWS account if it was in a different region. You would have two separate AWS accounts. And so the other account that we're going to talk about is the typical AWS account, one that you may have today, uh, or you can create a new one. This is just a standard AWS account. Everything that you do in this account, as it is today, you pay for it. So if you consume, you know, turn up EC2 instances, you pay for it. If you're using storage, you're using S3, the story remains the same. It's the standard AWS account. But one thing that's different about this account is that when you go through the provisioning process with VMware, you have an opportunity to either request a new AWS account be created on your behalf or link to an existing account that you already have. And what the linking is doing is there's actually endpoints that we will deploy into your account. Now, this is important, and as I go through the deep dive on the infrastructure, you'll see. Uh, this is what really creates the bridging between the two VPCs, the two accounts, the ability for you to consume native AWS services. And it comes only with customer consent. So it's not like VMware is just gonna randomly go start deploying endpoints into your accounts. You, you're gonna tell them, yes, you may do that, and then, oh, by the way, uh, you may even have the opportunity to say, put it on these subnets. Because if it's an existing account that you have workloads running in there, you may wanna have a particular subnet that you want the endpoints living on. Um, now, because it's inside of your account, you also have full control of those endpoints. So things like security groups, ACLs, for the subnets that they live on, those are all still within your control. And as a result of these endpoints living inside of your environment, that makes the VMC environment, or it enables the VMC environment to now be able to consume native services. So how do you access this? How do you use it? Well, there's really two access models. There's the, uh, the simplified model, and then there's a, a little more uh, advanced model. But before I get into those models, you've got to keep in mind a couple things. Remember, this is a service. It's being run by AWS at the physical layer only, right? We manage the resources, just like normal. We're responsible for the resources the underlying infrastructure, make sure that those things are all up and running, the physical resources. VMware manages the hypervisor on up. And then the customer, you manage everything inside of the VMware environment. So if you look at it from an operating model and an access model, this, these are kind of the D marks, right? Where do the things cross and they don't cross. And so your access is really two ways that you can access the environment. You can go through the VMC portal uh, which everything that you'll do with this account is actually driven through the portal. Um, and then there's the HTML5 client for vCenter, is how you get into and manage all the vCenter resources. Couple things, a couple restrictions. It's a service that's being operated on your behalf, it's being delivered for you. So you won't have root access to ESX. You, it, you can't do that, you can't deliver a, a service with an SLA and then allow customers to go in and change things at that layer. So that's completely abstracted away from the customers of this service, which, you know, may not be an issue for many customers. For other customers, they may be like, well, hold on a second. I want to have a little more control. But this is, a, this is pretty much a hard and fast rule right here. Um, the distributed switches, the VDSs, and any of the edges, those will be deployed for you. And the core plumbing that needs to occur within the VPC, the, the VMware VPC, in order for these components to work will be done on your behalf to get them to work. So you won't be able to change those. But when you're getting into some of the distributed switches and the edge configurations for how you're gonna operate the environment, that's a different discussion.
but the actual plumbing for the way this thing operates inside of your account is locked out, is abstracted away from you. And so if we go into the simplified mode and we look at it, the customer goes into the VMC web portal, makes a request for the service, service is stood up, auto deployment of the provisioning occurs, um, a prescriptive network topology is put out there for you. And there's some, you know, there is some, uh, you do have a little bit of poetic license through the VMC portal, um, but it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be scoped down to, narrowly scoped down to some specific uh, decisions that you need to make. VPN connections, uh, those types of things can be all be done through the portal and executed through the portal. In terms of it managing the environment, it's the H H5 vSphere client the web version of this. So you'll continue to manage that and manage your environments. So you'll consume these pre-created resources. Now if we go over to advanced mode, which will be you know, coming on as part of the product, the thing that changes is it's not, you're not forced, your workflow isn't forced to send you through the VMC portal, but network admins, NSX managers will have full NSX UI access. So, the big thing here is some of the advanced use cases. So if you want to get into the, micro, uh, the distributed firewalls, micro-segmentation of services at the kernel level, um, these things start to become available for you when you're in, running in the advanced mode. <clears throat> the vSphere client, still the same thing. You just are working in an environment that you actually have a little bit more control around. And so let's get into a tech overview. What are we talking about here? I said earlier, we're talking, this is an EC2 instance. It's a bare metal EC2 instance. And it's based off of our i3 family of instances. So if you're familiar with the i3s, we announced them at reInvent last year. They're pretty beefy. We've got a lot of cores, a lot of memory, and not as much as the X's, but a lot of memory. Uh, and they have onboard storage, really fast storage. So let's look at these. So from a compute, we're talking about 36 physical CPUs in each instance, um, 512 gig of RAM, and you're gonna get 16 terabytes of local NVMe flash storage in each host. Now, if, if you're familiar with vSAN, vSAN requires onboard storage, and at least a portion of the, the disk groups needs to be solid state. Well, it's all solid state in this case. The NVMe uh, devices are really fast, really fast. And so when you're starting with a four node cluster, you have this as your, your host times four. This is your starting configuration. When you get into the storage, the only thing that's using EBS in this environment is the ESX kernel. It's being booted from ESX. So if you think about it, we're taking over and we're using AWS constructs, so one of the things that affords VMware the ability to rapidly provision environments is the fact that they can have an ESX AMI sitting out there, pull it down, launch it on the infrastructure, and then are up and running. The rest can continue. When you get into vSphere, so HA, vMotion, uh, DRS, all of those things still continue to operate. They're gonna to continue to operate as they normally would. Now there's a fourth bullet point there that may be new to some folks, and it's Elastic DRS. And it's a capability that the teams are working to make sure is delivered at some point in this product, which will allow you to take advantage of things in a very similar fashion to the way you would if you were dealing, uh, launching a cluster using auto scaling on AWS. And the thought here is, is with DRS, DRS is intelligent enough, it is intelligent enough to know when its cluster is in a healthy state. If the nodes, the member nodes, as part of a cluster are in a healthy state, and then you program the rules and can create the different uh, behaviors and actions and mitigations should something fall into a, an unhealthy state. Well, the thought here with Elastic DRS would be, what if your entire cluster is running hot and you need more resources? So very similar to the way you would handle it with auto scaling, you just set upper and lower limits in terms of the number of nodes that you would allow into the cluster, and then you have DRS spawn additional ESX resources, additional nodes, and, and automatically uh, provision the storage and provision all the components to then join it into the cluster. 
and then the opposite is true. If you don't need the resources and you have, and you set a low, you set your threshold, and if you fall below a threshold for utilization, as an example, maybe you shrink the cluster. So these are things that do a nice job of crossing over from what AWS does natively and what VMware does natively. And it's a great demonstration of linking the two together. And there'll be a lot of value, I think, that can come from that. On the networking side, you're running on a hardware uh, platform that's based off of i3, uh, 10 gigabit network speeds plus. I always like to pay, you know, point out that the little plus marks there uh, because it's, it's pretty robust hardware. You're gonna get great performance. Uh, inner node performance is gonna be very solid. And then you have the, the endpoints, the private endpoints that get deployed. <clears throat> and so if we look at the vSAN, it's vSAN. It's the vSAN solution sitting on top of the bare node or the bare metal infrastructure that has 16 terabytes of NVMe flash storage sitting inside of it. So then your storage groups get created and it consumes all of the disk. So as a user of this environment, you do not have the ability, again, there's some things that are abstracted away from you, you're not gonna go in and fidget with the storage group settings. You're not gonna resize them, change, you know, steal resources from uh, the, uh, you know, the, the right buffer and move it over to capacity drives. You're not gonna do that, it's gonna be pre-provisioned for you. If you want additional storage currently, you would just add another node to the cluster and you would get the additional, additional allocation. And so if we get into NSX, this was the one that always twisted my head around when I was very early days on this, trying to keep my head around it. So you're dealing with an SDDC software, industry leading platform for SDDC, uh, for you know, private networks. It's, and it's continuing to grow in the marketplace irrespective of the relationship with AWS. So it supports over 10 gig performance capacity and it's been running on bare metal. And it's full featured from a switching, routing, firewall, VPN, all the things that you would need in your SDDC, all the same and similar things that you get when you're dealing with a, uh, v, VMware, or I'm sorry, VPC natively. A lot of these components, these are all built into it. But the switching part's the one that always turned my mind around. So you have VPC is the basis, so you have a, basically a, an L3 network and then you're encapsulating a logical L2, and then you're doing L3 routing over top of that, so and I was like, man, this is crazy. How did I pull this off? Um, and so it actually works, it actually works really well. In fact, uh, we've had the opportunity have, to have customers in our early access program uh, for the last couple months have been actually operating on this platform. And, it really, it, and we've gotten very favorable feedback, and from a performance perspective, I haven't once heard somebody say, you know what, this thing's not fast enough. Um, <laughs> in, in some of the testing, actually, some of, um, uh, one of my colleagues at VMware said, yeah, they did a load test. They just wanted to prove that they could do it. They launched 1,000 VMs onto the cluster all at once, did a massive boot storm, and the thing handled it, no problem. So they were happy with the performance there. And so this is kind of give you the duck and bunny version of the network. You know, ducks and bunnies, got to keep it simple, right? But if you look at it, I like, to, I like to use this illustration because it becomes pretty clear um, what's happening here. What are the components that we're moving with? The underlay network is, that's your VPC, right? And then you have the bare metal ESX nodes, and then you get into the NSX components and the encapsulation that's occurring there. They turn the lights on, were they kicking me out or what? <laughs> I don't know, sorry. Um, so let's get into a technical drill down around this. So you start out with an existing customer environment. Looks pretty normal, right? Existing customer data center. Got a mix of physical resources, virtual resources. And then you have the ability, if you're not currently running NSX in your on-prem VMware environment, and if you don't have any immediate plans to do so, you can still interface with this environment by deploying a standalone NSX appliance in that environment. Um, why do that? Well, if you want to take advantage of some of the more, of some of the more advanced features, you would do this, but it's not a requirement. You could use your edge you know, boundary networks and connect into uh, the, 
the VMC environment and get some capabilities that will work fine for what you need, uh, but they may not give you all full features like vMotion and things like that. <clears throat> and so once you have the environment provision, or, or you, know, you have your environment identified and you make the request to provision the environment, all of the resources will be stood up for you and auto provision, again, single tenant, AWS account, provisioned and, and stood up on your behalf. Now, one of the things that I've, um, I've added to this, this architecture that hasn't been there previously is that there's an internet gateway at the bottom of this VPC. And so there's been a lot of debate back and forth. It's like, should we have an internet gateway on the VMware account? Should we force the traffic to go through the customer account? You know, what should we do? What's the best way of handling it? And ultimately, we've kind of got mixed um, feedback from different customers. And it clearly falls down the line of what are your compliance requirements is one of them. That's a big driver. Uh, or perhaps it's your sensitivity, security, and, and wanting to have control over different boundaries. So ultimately, what we have is a situation here where th we've added an internet gateway for certain things, for certain traffic to be able to flow directly into the SDDC account, that's the VMware account, without forcing you to go through the, the uh, customer account. Now, whether or not that is the default path that people will follow in the future, I think it's up to the customer. Not I think, it is up to the customer. At some point, uh, customers may change their mind or say, no, we want to route everything through the other account. So we wanted to give the customer options, not trying to force you down one path or the other. And so once that account has been provisioned, remember part of the process for provisioning an account was coming up with a linking process. So you identify an AWS account that you're going to link to, that, that linking occurs, but you're not necessarily required to use the account. And this is, you know, I don't I want to erase any confusion for anybody out there. There's not a requirement that you run everything through your AWS account. There is a requirement that the account exists because we want to make sure that when it comes time or should the time come around that you want to consume native AWS services, you don't have any artificial blockers in the way from you to do that. And so, as I mentioned with the internet gateway being attached directly to the VMware account, you could literally run all of your routing through that and in other, other paths here in a minute, I'll show you, and not touch your account. So you're gonna connect back to the data center. So there's a lot of ways you can do this, a lot of ways you can connect back. So for my purposes, I said, well, probably our large enterprise customers are likely gonna be running a direct connect. So from a direct connect point of view, you want to connect that to an AWS account that you, the customer, owns and controls. A couple different reasons for that. One is you're going to manage the costs associated with it. Second, you're in control of the transit. You make the decisions associated with the transit. Um, with the direct connect product and service, even though you may be connected to your, a your customer AWS account, you have the ability to provision uh, private virtual interfaces that you can connect to other accounts and you can do as many of those as you'd like up to the service limits, right? That's no different in this case. And so connecting to it, we can create a secondary transit path off of that direct connect, create a hosted uh, private virtual interface and route the traffic for the compute, for vMotion, cluster management, route that all directly to the VMware account. Now, you could certainly do all of this with a VPN connection as well. I didn't want to kill you with slides, so I just picked Direct Connect and went with that one. But just think about it. You know, let your imagination run wild. The flexibility that you guys have uh, on the AWS platform today, it still really does exist here. So you have, you know, for me the big thing is, especially if I'm going to certify a platform, and I want to demonstrate um, the appropriate level of control over an environment if I need to get it certified or I'm trying to meet some compliance regime, one of the most important things that I want to make sure that I have demonstrated control over is transit. And I think here's an opportunity for you to demonstrate that control. And so once these accounts are, you know, they coexist, we have the linking that occurs. Endpoints get deployed. So I pick a subnet or subnet will be provisioned 
subnet gets dropped uh, or is in, identified in the VPC, endpoints get deployed into it, and then now you have the ability to consume any of the native AWS services. That endpoint's key, because that endpoint presents itself inside of your network. If you're looking at just a customer VPC view of the world, inside of your account, you can go into the management console, you can query the APIs, and look and see what's in your environment. If you see the endpoints, it presents locally inside of your VPC. And so a lot of the things that you can not, you, you know, it opens the door for a lot of things. Now, behind the scenes, you have connectivity that's occurring inside of the, the VMware account through the uh, NSX edges. Those are gateways of sorts, right? So the NSX is the gateway from within the, the VMware um, account to the customer VPC, and then there's also a path to the internet gateway. And so if we look at some use cases, some examples, so one is, everybody likes to vMotion, right? Want to do vMotion. So let's vMotion a workload from on-prem into the cloud. Now, a note about vMotioning. vMotioning will work inside of VMC. It's a native capability. It's part of VMware. It's going to operate inside of the VMware cloud. But this is, in this scenario, I'm talking about pulling a workload from your on-prem data center and putting it into uh, VMware cloud. The next would be, I want to talk to an S3 object. I either want to do a put, a get, fetch, all the SMTP commands or um, HTTP commands that you can think of. I want to do that from within VMC to a bunch, uh, an S3 bucket. And so then you want to be able to connect a machine inside of your environment to a managed service. In this example, I'm talking about Redshift. This very easily could be RDS as an example. And then we get into how do you access from the public internet, how you source traffic from the public internet and hit a resource that's running inside of VMware Cloud. So let's go to the first one. So here we have our architecture that we laid out before. And if we identify a, a workload that lives on-prem and we want to move it out to VMware Cloud, if you notice the path, we have the dotted line path there and there's a whole bunch of different lines. We have the ability to do vMotioning across that path and into the environment. Again, this transit's being managed by you, the customer. So if you have a direct connect and you provision a private interface and you attach it to a cross account, to the VMware account, and attach it to a virtual private gateway, we're in business, right? So now, accessing S3. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. So initially it was before we put the internet gateway onto the SDDC account, the path was being really forced through the customer account. But now you have options, right? So the rules of S3 and S3 endpoints, they all still apply, right? And what I mean by that, in the, in the AWS world, if you attach a, an S3 endpoint to your VPC, that gives you the ability to access any of the buckets that are in S3 within that region, within the chosen region. And so they'll transit through the endpoint. Now, why is the endpoint not on the SDDC account? Well, when you start transiting and uh, accessing resources and doing things like that, there is the potential that you're gonna incur costs. Right, And there's a few other things that you want to have control over the ACLs to access these buckets, as an example. That's not something VMware is in the business of doing, manage your, managing the security around your environment as it pertains to these native services. You're clearly managing the services and the security within the VMC account, but when it comes to services that you want to add on, you're not going to be making a support call to VMware saying, hey, can you add and attach an endpoint for me? And, run this command to create the ACL so that I can, no. That's not their deal. That's yours to manage. You operate that. And so if we look at the, the path for the fetch, the put, the get, whatever it may be, you're gonna flow through the endpoint, can route through the VPC endpoint and hit the bucket. Now, if you wanna hit an endpoint that is not in this region, 
you have a couple options, right? If your customer account has a internet gateway attached to it, you could flow out that way. But you could also go out the internet gateway that's on the SDDC. Now you start getting into routing decisions and configuration options. So Redshift. Redshift, as is RDS, it's a service that's managed and operated by AWS. And when you stand up that service and you provision the resource, it presents itself in your account and in your VPC, target VPC, as an endpoint. And so communicating to those services is through the endpoint. And so as you can imagine, in this example, we have the resource that we moved over from on-prem into VMware Cloud. We want to communicate. You're going to communicate through the endpoint directly. And so this is a use case that um, I've done a lot of these talks, both in summits and in, in cu direct customer engagements. And this is the one that usually catches customers the most. They're like, wow, man, RDS becomes a real option for me here. I can get rid of running databases. Or perhaps customers that are looking to um, move away from Oracle and they're looking at Aurora as an option. I mean, it's, it, this, this opens up a lot of options for customers. And so when we go to internet access, so how are you gonna get to this thing? Well, if we had this talk two weeks ago, this would be a different conversation, but today we now have multiple paths. First path would be to connect to that same virtual machine from the internet, source the traffic from the internet. I don't care what kind of traffic it is, because when it gets into firewall rules and things like that, you have control over your destiny in that, on that front. But if you notice, there's a path from the internet to the virtual uh, to the internet gateway that's in the, the SDDC account, the VMware account. And so now that you have that internet gateway there, and the plumbing is in place to route the traffic from the internet gateway to the NSX edge, which NSX is going to manage a lot of the firewalling and the natting and things like that that are going to occur to get access into the VMC network, <laughs> you have to make sure that Elastic IPs are assigned, and then the adding rules are configured within NSX. So if you're a VMware admin, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But it's just being done on the AWS platform. Now, assigning and requesting the Elastic IPs, these are things that you would do through the, the, the VMware portal. So now, you have our happy face person here, because everybody that's on the internet's a nice person and they only have good intentions when they want to talk to you. Um, their path would just follow right through the internet gateway, hit the NSX edge, be evaluated for its trustworthiness and whatever else you put in place, and then delivered to the workload that has been de designated to receive it. What we have here is a pretty standard topology. Now, some customers are going to have some really robust and big environments, and but when it comes down to the basic plumbing, this is all still the same. It's all pretty straightforward. And so you have the opportunity and the control to make a lot of design decisions here. And so when we get into security and governments, and governance, sorry, we talk about it. Remember, the endpoints live inside of your customer account. So if you don't want certain traffic communicating with the VMC cluster, as an example, you have control of that. Security groups, ACLs. Um, and then there's also the configuration at the NSX, the edge gateway that's also running inside of the account that you, gives you additional sets of controls. And so because you own the transit path, you can make all of the security decisions around the transit path. You have control of that. VMware, as far as their concern is, you're going to have a transit path that's going to connect into the environment, and you're likely going to pick which gateway you're going to hit it from because if it's a, a direct connect, you're gonna go through the virtual private gateway, and if it's coming from a VPN connection, you go through the internet gateway path. So when you get into vMotion, you're gonna be running the latest version and stack of the VMware software. You have the option to have the, VM, uh, the vMotion traffic encrypted. Uh, it's now a supported capability. And then you could do also VM level encryption inside the data store, that's an additional capability that's been recently launched. Audit quality logging. This one's kind of near and dear to my heart because, well, if you're dealing, in, dealing with governments, 
they definitely want to know everything about it, everything inside of the IT environment. Um, before the logging that was occurring in VMware was basically it was something happened. This happened, can't tell you who did it, but it happened and we think it happened on this day. Now that's been enhanced to, where, to the point to where there's attribution. So now we know who did the change, when it happened, what, was, you know, what were the changes that occurred. And the reason why this is near and dear to my heart is because now you take things like CloudTrail, flow logs, and some of your um, CloudWatch metrics, and you can start to mash these things together into a unified view of the world when it comes to security, when it comes to operations. You don't have to feel like you have a blind spot here. Just because it's an operating environment that you do not manage, you, you don't have the blind spot. And it's fully managed and delivered by VMware. It's important to keep in mind. You're not going to go into AWS and select the icon that says VMC and then it launches into your account. It's not, it's not what we have here. What we have is a, a service that is sold by VMware. And it's operated by VMware and it's managed by VMware. And so all the patching, all the upgrades, all of the fun associated with those things, um, you've effectively offloaded it to VMware. And they're you know, standing up a world-class team to manage that at scale, at a big scale. And so if you're looking for some additional information, we have um, this, uh, this site, marketing site, that you can subscribe to. And you'll get updates as to uh, service updates, uh, events perhaps. Uh, this is basically our, uh, our um, conduit to reach you, to keep you posted on what's going on here with the product. Um, it's, a, it's an exciting time for us. We've been announcing that you know, it's summer 2017. Well, we're in the summer. <laughs> so some cool things to come. Um, thank you. I appreciate everybody's time. We're at the end of the session here, but I will make myself available here uh, to take some questions. Thank you.